friends, you could not find a better pair to discuss the topic of migration today, especially at such an important time in our world as we are living in right now. Ambassador Marta Barcina Koki is the current ambassador uh, of Mexico to the United States, a post she has held since 2018. Ambassador Barcina studied on three continents, including as a Fulbright scholar in the United States. She speaks four languages. She has, uh, a, a, her diplomatic career has spanned four decades and she has served um, not only in the United States, but as an ambassador in Europe and uh, Central Asia as well. During her tenure in Washington, she has helped Americans living north of the border better understand the partnership that is the US-Mexico relationship that our economy and our well-being here in the States is tied to Mexico and to Mexicans. Ambassador Barcina is married to a career, a retired career diplomat, and has two daughters. The Honorable David Miliband is president and CEO of the International Rescue Committee, a humanitarian organization with an 80-year history with work currently in at least 40 war-torn countries and support for refugee uh, resettlement also here in the United States. Before joining the IRC, Mr. Miliband served as Foreign Secretary of the United Kingdom, beginning his career in the Labour Party under Tony Blair and serving for 12 years as a Member of Parliament. It's important for you to know that Mr. Milban is the son of Jewish refugees who fled Belgium and Poland, I believe that's correct, during World War II. He now lives in New York and has, uh, with his wife and two sons. Welcome to you both. What a privilege to be in this room with you even though we are at a distance. Thank you, Mindy, very much looking forward to the conversation. Thank you, Mindy. It's really a pleasure to be here with you today addressing this very important issue. Very important issue. The topic of global migration has been before both of you for many years now. Mm -hmm. And, um, and in, instead of seeing light at the end of the tunnel, we find ourselves in the midst of, of uh, ongoing crises, layered crises, I would say, in 2020. And, and crises that are inescapable, inescapably at the front and center of all of our lives. Um, the COVID-19 pandemic and its disruptions to health, well-being, and the economies of the nations is something that's affecting everyone everywhere, including in our audience. Um, the outcome of the U.S. presidential election also is, is uh, something that, as we are recording today, has not yet been determined. Um, our country is tense here in the United States, and for the world, that is an additional crisis, a crisis of U.S. leadership that could prove destabilizing. And as both of you know, destabilizing forces are the things that feed migration, and so we want to touch in the time that we have on these major, major issues. And I thank you again for being with us. Let me begin um, just, just by asking you to give, and Ambassador Barcina, let's, uh, let's turn to you first, to give your rapid assessment, if you would, of how the pandemic has changed transnational movement. And um, specifically, you know, we speak of COVID hotspots. I'd like you to speak to the migration hotspots that you are watching during this pandemic? Um, yes, Mindy, of course. I would say that uh, before the pandemic, what we were seeing uh, in the migration movement, let's say between Mexico and the US and between the, the region in the American continent, what we were seeing was a diminishing migration of Mexicans to the US but an increasing migration of other nationalities to the U.S. through the Mexican territory. Uh, what we were seeing this because of more economic opportunities in Mexico, because uh, there were coming more Mexicans uh, under programs like H-2A visas to the U.S., so they didn't they didn't cross undocumented. 
and, uh, and, and this trend was taking place, let's say, in the last, in the last five years. Then in 2018 and 2019, both countries, we confronted the crisis of basically the Central American refugees. And why they were migrating from Central America? Basically because there was a huge drought and because they had lost hope <laughs> in their opportunities for the future. So they started coming in uh, greater amounts and not only the traditional single male migrant, but families migrating as a whole to the US and basically not migrating as undocumented, looking for jobs, but looking for asylum. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Mexico and the U.S. had to confront this common challenge in 2018-2019 that, to be totally honest, we were not really prepared to deal with. What happened with the pandemic is that what we have seen is, uh, even uh, in the first moment, a total reduction of these migration patterns that we have seen in 2018 and 2019. Why? Because of different reasons. Because some of the Central American countries totally locked down their countries. So there was no chance to go out from those countries, neither to come in. And, and also because there was a lockdown in the U.S. and a lockdown in Mexico. So many sectors of the economy closed. So that crossing, uh, based on economic reasons, also diminished. That was at the beginning of the pandemic. And several measures were taken by, by Mexico and the U.S. and by the U.S. and Canada to limit the land crossings that are the most important ones between our countries only to essential travels. So what we have seen with the pandemic is it's, it's a constant decrease of migration, both on those seeking asylum and to those looking for jobs. But that doesn't mean that the root causes of this migration have disappeared. Mm -hmm. On the contrary, we are uh, maybe seeing uh, like a pent up building pressure. People that cannot move now because of the restrictions on movement because of the pandemic, but the root causes are still there. The drought mm -hmm. in Central America, it's, it's very bad. Even if, if the last three days we have had a hurricane in Nicaragua and Honduras that it's have totally flooded Honduras. Uh, but we have the problems that the economic, um, the lack of economic growth, uh, just to make, to even say a little bit more dramatic, the economic collapse that we are seeing because of COVID in the whole world, but also in our region, it is estimated by the IMF and by ECLAC, CEPAL, that the Latin American region will have a decrease in growth of around 9%, minus 9%. Uh, so the, the root causes of migration are not only there, but even growing. So what we will see maybe in the medium term, it's an increased pressure for the migration to continue. And we will need to find the right avenues to process these migration to have an orderly, safe, and regular migration as the global compact negotiated in the UN has as a, as a goal. Thank you. Secretary Melband, what about you? What are the hot spots that you are particularly looking at right now? Well, first of all, let me say that I should concentrate my remarks in a way that complements what the ambassador said. She's done a, I can compliment her, but also complement her, sorry to be pedantic. She's given a brilliant overview of the uh, movement south of the US border. Let me take a rather global perspective rather than trying to repeat what she said. And in a situation that is complicated, it's important to simplify. And I think the ambassador has done a great job of speaking to the economic and the climatic conditions that are driving uh, migration. I want to move along the spectrum to the political elements that are driving movement, because we know that before COVID, if we'd been having this conversation in February 2020, we would have seen record numbers of people who were classified as forced migrants, refugees and internally displaced as a result of war, conflict and persecution. Uh, 80 million people, according to the UN data, were forcibly uh, removed from their homes uh, in the preceding year. 
and more than 1% of the global population, 45 million internally displaced, 35 million refugees and asylum seekers who cross borders. And the hotspots are, are old and new. Old, I mean, Afghanistan. There are two and a half million, three million Afghans in uh, Pakistan, um, many of whom actually have never been to Pakistan, in, in Afghanistan because they were born in Pakistan to mm -hmm. Afghan refugees. Um, there are also probably 600,000 Afghans in Iran. Uh, we also know that countries like Somalia have exported large numbers of people to Ethiopia. We know we must now put, put classify um, Syria as almost a decade-long conflict. And of course, there are five and a half, six million refugees from Syria, uh, more than half of them in Turkey, the rest of them in the Middle East and in Europe. Uh, that certainly qualifies Mindy as a hotspot that you uh, sure. were interested uh, in. But there are also some more recent uh, displacements, which I think bring together the elements of p politics and economics. Venezuela would be one example, five million people left Venezuela for a mix of political and economic reasons in the last um, couple of years. And I just want to draw your, um, the attention of your audience to the way that political failure, diplomatic failure, generates churn, both internal displacement and refugee flows. And since we're meeting on Friday the 7th of November, this is the day when what's happening in Ethiopia is beginning to get global attention. Uh, without doing a complete deep dive into it. I think it's an interesting example of a hotspot. It's a country that historically has hosted hundreds of thousands of refugees from Eritrea. Uh, two years ago, the new prime minister um, committed to, to a new peace settlement with Eritrea, and he won the Nobel Prize for that. But just this week, we're hearing about the recrudescence, the renewal of domestic tensions within Ethiopia at a time when there are already more internally displaced in that country than there are refugees in that country. And so my point to provide a global perspective that complements what the ambassador has so well said is that as we think about the global management of migration, it's really important, I think, uh, not just to, to say it's complicated. There's some elements of migration that are forced migration that I think have different legal global status, but also, frankly, different moral status. If you're bombed from your home in uh, Aleppo, you're in a different position than if you would like to move to another country where you think you've got a better standard of life. It's not as simple as that, but I think it's important to, to keep that in mind. And pre-COVID, we were in record numbers of people forced from their homes by conflict and disaster. COVID has frozen borders in many places, but it hasn't frozen the conditions that are generating movement of people, if anything, it's added to them. It's certainly added to the economic. And in some ways, my fear is that over the next year, it's going to add the political. These are the strains that we can see around the world in global politics. Let me stay with you, Secretary Milben, if you don't mind, to move into talking a little bit about the, the, the infrastructure, the architecture of, of sort of, it seems to me what both of you are, are saying means that shelter becomes more important in, in the short term, at least. Um, but the short term tends to become the long term with some of the places you've mentioned, like Syria, the, the number of Syrians in Turkey. So when we think about the architecture that under normal circumstances, the legal processing, the physical processing of migrants, either, either onward to a country where they can resettle or back to their homes or, or settling where they are. Um, how has, uh, this is a hard question, but the pandemic and it seems to me the Trump administration's restrictive policies have, have in similar ways served to put a clamp, uh, served to freeze or paralyze the system. Is that, is that accurate as you look at, at things as a whole? How, how is this, can the system be rebuilt? Let's, let's just go out on a limb and say that the United States is looking at um, a President Joe Biden in 2021, and, and, and he has pledged to change um, our immigration and refugee policies. Can the system be rebuilt from where it has been in the last three, four, five years? 
Well, look, it can certainly be improved. And I think it's really important. We're a non-political organization, but we can speak to evidence and to expertise, both from within America and around the world. The first thing to say is that uh, I'm obviously not an American, as you can tell from my accent and from my biography. Um, but America is a country that historically has had bipartisan support on refugee policy. Mm -hmm. So uh, Ronald Reagan admitted more refugees to America than any other uh, American president. And it seems to me that a day when Americans are still arguing about tax and education and abortion and guns, I mean, that's, that's fine. It would be great if, there came, if we could get back to a day when America's responsibilities towards refugees could become a source of bipartisan problem solving rather than partisan sniping. And I don't think that's impossible. Uh, just to state the obvious, America can't solve every refugee problem in the world, mm -hmm. but here are ways that it can really make a start and offer a lead that gives other countries the, the, the right way to do things. I'm a great believer. You start with what you control. Now, the first thing it controls is how many American, how, how many uh, refugees does America allow in for refugee resettlement, the organized mm -hmm. security-based transfer of the most vulnerable to a new life in America. Historically, that's been 95,000 a year. The Trump administration has cut it to 15,000 a year. Uh, Vice President Biden has said he wants to re reach 125,000 a year. Um, that is doable. Uh, yeah. Those are people who are vetted while they're abroad. They're then met at the airport when they get here. Mm -hmm. Churches, voluntary organizations, NGOs like the International Rescue Committee, we're the largest refugee resettlement agency in America in 25 cities. We meet people at the airport, we get their kids into school, we get them into the employment market, we help them uh, buy a car, we have 98% repayment rates on our car loans, um, you need a car if you're in America. Um, so that's within the America's control, even at the time of COVID, that is doable. Um, second thing that America can do is make sure that its asylum processing system is fast and efficient. At the moment, if you cross the border into the US and claim asylum, and you're either sent back to Mexico, where you're in danger, or you're stuck three or four years waiting for your case to be processed. In Germany, which processed one and a half million asylum claims in 2015 and 16, it takes eight to 10 weeks to process an asylum claim. In America, it takes three to four years. That's crazy. Mm -hmm. This doesn't make sense. I'm leading a humanitarian organization. That doesn't mean I say everyone should be allowed in. That's not a, that's not a sensible position. Uh, but you've got to have a process that delivers fast and efficient processing. Third thing, countries that are hosting refugees, which is most poor countries around the world, they need support from richer parts of the world. Because if you don't support the Jordans and Lebanons of this world, if you don't support the Ugandas and Ethiopias of this world, if you don't support the Bangladeshis of this world, you end up generating more people flowing out of those countries. So America's international aid policy becomes important. And there's enormous room, I think, for America to be a country that recognizes the global public good that is delivered by poor countries hosting refugees. That becomes really important as well. I think fourthly, don't worry, there's not 55 points, there's only five points. Fourthly, we know that there are specific groups who are most at risk as they leave their own homes and leave their own countries. Those may be religious minorities. Those may be women and girls. They're not a minority, they're a majority. And I think rather than thinking about shelter, which you, I would emphasize protection. People need to be protected. That means they need access. Where is there a safe house that I can get away from someone from a gang that's chasing me or a husband who's chasing me? Where can I find um, uh, safety for my kids and myself? Uh, mm -hmm. Which community is going to integrate me? Who should I trust when they say that they're going to give me a voucher with some money about it? How do I reach a UN agency that can then register me? Though, which part of the local government system is okay? In countries where there are non-state actors, we work in northeast Nigeria, we work in northwest Syria, you've got internal displacement, but you've also got non-state groups that are affiliated with extremist organizations. Mm -hmm. So you've got to focus on those most at risk, mm -hmm. which I think is absolutely um, essential. And I've forgotten my fifth point, so I'm happy to stop there. Well, that's that's a great point to, to turn to uh, um, Ambassador Barsina. You know, you've talked about... Um, building bridges instead of building walls at the U.S.-Mexico mm -hmm. border. Um, we, we, we have a little bit of a wall, so, so how, do, how, do we, how do we build bridges when we have a pandemic in the way and, and many of the, the sorts of challenges um, that uh, Secretary Milband has highlighted? Oh, 
let me see. Well, I really, I really appreciate very much this question and also what uh, Secretary Milliband was just saying. I think to build bridges, you need uh, basically a concept that we have been losing in the, in the last months. And that concept is trust. Mm -hmm. and, and the other issue is how do you perceive and how do you conceptualize migration and refugee? If you conceptualize migration as a national security issue, if you securitize the issue of migration, and what it's even worse, if you criminalize migration, then your approach always be like a policing contention reduction of migration. So what we need is really to conceptualize migration as it is. It is an economic and social and political phenomena. And I think Secretary Milliband has described some of the issues uh, very well uh, in, the last, uh, in the last question. And, but also you need to understand that migration follows also a com complementarity of demographic profiles and complementarity of labor markets. And, uh, and your approach to migration and to border policies will depend on how do you conceptualize migration and how do you build trust. And you, if you want to build trust, then you go to a concept of cooperation, of protection, the most vulnerable. But if you are just fighting a national security uh, challenge, then you go into the defensive. It's, how do I protect my border? How do I protect the, the demographic composition of my country? Which is a very critical issue in all transnational movement of, of migration. Mm -hmm. So how, how do we build these, uh, how, how do we build bridges? Is building trust, and that means we need to have cooperation, and cooperation is based on a constant communication. So, uh, even if, if, if one of the countries is going to take a measure that the other doesn't like, like for example, Title, title 42 mm -hmm. in the case of the, of the US, uh, if we are informed and if we talked about this in advance, then we are ready and we are better prepared to deal with the issues. If you negotiate with a good faith on how the, the different approaches to refugees can be done, then it's much better that if you are put against the wall saying either you do this or you accept this uh, agreement or then there will be some other kind of measures. So trust is, is key to, to guarantee uh, the proper approach to migration. And uh, in the case of, of how we have been building uh, bridges is one, uh, we have kept a constant communication with, between the Mexican government and the US government. Does that mean that we agree on everything? No. Mm -hmm. Does that mean we litigate publicly? No. We, uh, we have very tough conversations privately, but we try not to litigate public and to advance on, on what we can agree on and just simply agree to disagree in other areas. Another measure is that uh, even with a, ve a lot of pressure for migration, you have to have a certain order at your borders. So in our southern border, for example, of Mexico with Central America, you know, that southern border is the second largest jungle in the, in the Americas after the Amazon. So it's a very difficult border to supervise. And for many years, people have crossed back and forth constantly mm -hmm. without any supervision. So we had had some problems that there were a lot of people crossing the border undocumented and the organized crime was taking advantage of them. And we had this tragedy of San Fernando in Tamaulipas many years ago. So we have been doing an effort that sometimes have been misunderstood because maybe we have had some mistakes on how we implement this policy of ordering the southern border of Mexico, trying to know who is entering Mexico 
uh, to be able to better protect them. And I, I want to say this, uh, uh, talking about refugee requests, only in the last two years, 2019 and the months of 2020, we have received almost 100,000 requests of refugee status in Mexico, mm -hmm. which is numbers that are unprecedented. Mm -hmm. We have been conceding a lot of these uh, refugee status. I've not been able to tell you exactly the numbers because we also had a tragedy. The installations of our National Commission for Refugees suffered from the last earthquake in Mexico and we lost all the archives. Mm -hmm. We had to start processing again a lot of the request of refugees, uh, uh, of refugee status before 2018. And we have been doing this enormous effort to grant refugee status in Mexico to people from Honduras, Haiti, Cuba, even Africa, El Salvador. The main three nationalities now are Honduras, Haiti, and Cuba. And they are very much integrated into the Mexican economy. And this, I would like to, to make a point. When th there is a lot of misunderstanding on when people are returned to Mexico on the basis of MPP, that all the Mexican cities are dangerous. They are not. It, is it true that the refugees can be prey of organized crime? Yes, it is true. Uh, but if Mexico was so insecure, we wouldn't have 100,000 requests of refugee status. And we wouldn't have a larger community of Haitians already living in Tijuana since the last wave of uh, Haitians coming to Mexico. Can Mexico deal with the same number of refugees that the United States can deal with? Of course not. We don't have the economic capacity. We are, even if we are a large country of almost 130 million people, we are not 300 million people of the US. And we still have a very young population that is looking to integrate into the Mexican labor market. So we need, we, we simply cannot accept the same number of refugees that the US can do. And in this very moment, we are processing more refugees than the US is. And in the case of, uh, of MPPs, what, what for us is really important is, and maybe we can address uh, this issue a little bit later, is that the asylum hearings get, are put back into place as soon as possible. Mm -hmm. Because people are waiting in Mexico basically on two scenarios. Those already waiting for the asylum hearings to go forward and to... Asylum have, hearings in the United States? In the United States. Right. Asylum hearings in the United States. Mm -hmm. And the others are still what it is called in the phenomena metering. Even to be in the list to present its uh, request of asylum to the United States. And what we would like to, to see, of course, is that the U.S. embassies in Central America could process even more these requests of asylums instead of having people crossing through Mexico and asking asylum at the border. Mm -hmm. Right, mm -hmm. right. Well, um, that's so helpful for for both of you. I feel like we've gotten to the to the to the heart of it, and now is is the time that's so hard for a journalist because we're we're going to have to keep moving ahead, even though there's so much that you both have raised that we could dive into and, and talk, talk about for much longer. I want to ask you um, now, if, if you won't mind, looking ahead with us a little bit. Let's look to the future. Secretary Melbam, as the pandemic has com consumed so much of our global attention, um, how, how are you, as you are, I, I don't know how much you're traveling, um, Not at all. It's Groundhog Day. We're all stuck in our. Uh, we're, yeah, we're, we're we stuck, are all. We're stuck in perfectly. Ooh. The sun is shining and uh, Riverside Park is nearby. But um, we <laughs> haven't been on an airplane since I was in Mexico in um, in March, actually. Yeah, this is, this is our challenge that we all face. Um, so how how given these restrictions, given the pressure that we're all feeling from the pandemic. How are you keeping the, the things that you've outlined, the migration crisis front and center with the government leaders that you're meeting with and, and with the public? I mean, what, what are some key things, so many other pressures in the world right now to, 
you've highlighted why this issue is so important, but how now moving forward can we sustain the conversation and the priority that it is? Yeah. So look, the first responsibility of anyone running an NGO is to make sure that we're doing our own work well. So the fact that we've gone remote, the fact that we have invested in our infrastructure, the fact that we have 100% of our health programs working and in education, in employment, in livelihoods, in child protection, uh, half of our programs, maybe 60% have had to go remote, but they're still going. So mm -hmm. our first responsibility at the International Rescue Committee is to be the operational and thought leader of the humanitarian sector through the quality of the work that we do. Uh, we, we, we didn't abandon our strategy process, we followed through on it. Uh, we're focused on impact, on scale, um, on responding to local need by engaging local partnerships in, in innovative ways. So our, uh, the, 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 there's no point in speaking to the public if you're not doing your, your job properly. And yeah. so we've got to um, make sure that we're an organization that isn't just resilient in supporting its own people, but is innovative uh, as well, especially at these times. And we're trying to, to do that. Uh, secondly, and I think really um, important to say, um, our fundraising hasn't actually fallen off. I mean, people remain, um, uh, our supporters remain committed to us. Now, um, hopefully some of them are listening to this um, podcast and they'll, they'll, they'll receive my thanks and those that aren't will, will be interested in supporting us. But we've got to recognize that governments are under some pressure and we've got to make sure that we get the right balance of public and private support. Otherwise, we'll have to rein back. And the danger, of course, is that governments end up chasing their own tail as the famine conditions grow, as the headlines grow. They chase the headlines rather than sustainable uh, impact. Now, to directly answer your question, what's the best way to communicate to the public? I've got a very simple answer to that. It's not to have me talking. It's to have our clients talking. Mm -hmm. Because that's the way that you overcome the divisions of region and race and religion by... People who are our clients, whether in the US or around the world, when they speak and they say, I used to be a teacher, I used to be a farmer, I used to be a fitness instructor, I used to be an accountant, I used to be a housewife, they say that they reach out to people who then say, my goodness, it could have been me. Mm -hmm. And so to answer your question about communication, it's not about me, it's about them. And it's about direct communication. And we've we could all do, I think, a much better job at that. It's not us who should be speaking, it's our clients. Ambassador Barcina. Well, I think how, how do we see the future and the challenges of communication? And I mentioned a little bit uh, of this before. I think we get to know, uh, we have to have a better knowledge of what was really going on and what are the chances of of a better cooperation and a better under understanding of the phenomena that we're dealing with. I, I put the example of the border. If you see the Mexican-US border from the, from the point of view sometimes of the northeast of the US, uh, you would think that it's uh, one of the worst areas in the world of crime. Mm -hmm. But if you go and visit, you have problems and challenges but then you see that if the six states that are the border states of the U.S. and the four border states of Mexico, the 10 states were an independent country, they would be the third or fourth largest economy in the world. Mm -hmm. And you see a border in which we trade every minute $1 million. Mm -hmm. That in 2019, through San, San Diego and San Isidro, they crossed 70,000 vehicle passengers per day and 20,000 pedestrians per day is the, the most intense movement in the Western Hemisphere and, and the second more intense after Hong Kong and Jen. And it works. So if it works, that can mean we can improve. So we have to send the message that we can work for the future and we have to cooperate for the future and another message that I would like to, to say, and maybe it would be considered intervening, but it is not intervention, is I think everybody acknowledges that the immigration system in the US, including asylum, is broken. Mm -hmm. And this can only be solved by the US Congress itself. 
And uh, my conversations with both Democrats and Republicans at Congress is there is a huge acknowledgement of this broken system and the need to fix it. So uh, the moment they start conversations and, uh, and the moment they start to see how to, uh, how to mend this or how to overhaul the immigration system, it has to be based on facts and realities. Mm -hmm. And the facts and realities is these need to protect the most vulnerable, these need to keep open uh, the, the generosity towards refugees, this need to recognize the complementarity of labor markets and, and demographic profiles, the need for temporary workers maybe in the US, and the other very important thing that Secretary Miliband also mentioned. The US has always been a key player in the international arena and in the multinational institutions. If the US is not there as a main contributor in programs like World Food Program, like the UNHCR, all these, then they do not work and they are fundamental for the future. So we need a very strong presence of the US in all the international arena and the multinational institutions, a presence built on trust, a presence built on leadership. And then of course, we need, and that is from the very Mexican point of view, the overhaul of the immigration system of the US so that the US does not continue to outsource the solution to the challenges that it has on refugee and immigration on other countries. Outsourcing, it's not always good. Uh, so internal solutions could be better. But uh, uh, I'm an, I, I am an optimist. Mindy, a uh, total optimist. So I believe that the US is a country with great institutions, uh, with great people, and that uh, it will be able to deliver what the world is expecting from the US. And, uh, and uh, the Mexican government will continue to work with the US very, in a very cooperative matter, a manner in migration. And just to remember that really the Mexican government has been also very active and is, gives a lot of importance to multilateral institutions and to NGOs and to the humanitarian uh, work of UN and NGOs. And that is why we were some, one of the countries that was behind the global compact on migration and refugees and we will continue to be. So I am optimistic. Well, that's a, that's a, Great way for us to move toward um, what what has to be the conclusion to our conversation. I you've you both have have done such an amazing helpful job of laying out what you call the the facts and the reality of the situation. And I, I you speak as as an optimist. I want to ask you: is, is there a silver lining here to this to the pandemic? To in the in the midst of the breakdown, the broken system, the the rise of uh, the number of people seeking asylum um, and, and refugee status. Do you see a silver lining as, as we are now entering, you know, not eight, nine months of, of pandemic restrictions, something that we're learning, mm -hmm. something that is, is, uh, is, that we're gonna come out somehow better in, in one way or another on the other side of this? Yes. I see two basically silver linings. One, it's that the US has realized the need of the so-called essential workers. Mm. And most of the essential workers in the agricultural area, in the meatpacking industries, in hospitals, in grocery stores, have been migrants and a lot of them undocumented. Mm -hmm. And they have put their life in the first line mm -hmm. to keep the food on American tables and to keep the attention on hospitals. So the essential workers also need essential rights. They need to be recognized. Mm -hmm. And this has been the motto of our campaign of labor rights that we organized this uh, last October in the whole the US. But it's not only Mexican workers. It's Central American workers, South American workers, Haitians, Africans that have been here Somalis, Eritreans, essential workers, even uh, dreamers. I mean, 
30,000 Mexican dreamers were doctors, nurses, sanitary workers in hospitals. Mm -hmm. So the silver lining is that the US society is recognizing that these people are essential to their society. Mm -hmm. So they have to give them their essential rights. They have to incorporate them to recognize what they have contributed. And I think that uh, the pandemic also have shown us that the whole, all the countries are interdependent. And in the case of Mexico and the US, without any doubt that our economies are totally interrelated and interdependent. Mm -hmm. And I'm very proud that we work very hard that even during the pandemic, not even one factory in the US closed because of lack of supplies from Mexico. Mm -hmm. And we cooperated with the same sanitary measures and this. That doesn't mean that we didn't have challenges. We did have, and of course, we had a lot of people sick in factories, both in the U.S. and in Mexico and in Canada. But uh, uh, the silver lining is that COVID showed us how interdependent we are. And second, how important are the essential workers? And I think the third maybe silver lining that it's key for all the global society is that Pandemics do not recognize borders. Health has no borders. So we have to really deal from a global perspective. And these, with this global perspective, we have also to approach not only migration and refugees, but the access to medical equipment and the access to vaccines. I am really, uh, I would be really focused. And this is something that I offer Secretary Miliband continue working with this, that we can guarantee also vaccines to all the refugees that are in shelters, in refugee camps, in movements, because it will be essential for them to have this health protection, not only to our citizens, but to all these people that may, be, that may feel disenfranchised. And in this, we can work together. And this is why I say that I'm always optimistic and, and always try to be with, and, and in contact with people with full of ideas uh, to work for these global public goods. And this, the most essential global public good for the immediate future is the health of the, the world inhabitants. Secretary Melvin, that is a great way to turn to you on, on that really important issue of, of how vaccines are, are delivered. Um, to, to those who you are trying to help around the world. Um, and, and, and just is, is there, can, can we look for a, a brighter day uh, on the other side of this pandemic? Well, we should always look for a brighter day. I mean, that would be, if people who are essentially middle class and in relatively fortunate positions aren't looking forward to a brighter day, then we don't know how lucky we are. And so given the courage and the tenacity and the ideals and idealism of so many of the people that we serve, they don't give up. So yeah. if we start giving up, then we really, uh, we don't deserve to be where we are. So um, of course there can be a brighter day. Look, the, 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 on the vaccines question, um, one of my frustrations has been that there's been a lot more interest in the vaccine than there has been in protecting people now. Mm -hmm. There's a lot more interest in the vaccine than there is in running water. Whereas if you don't get running water, three billion people around the world have no running water in their own home. So you're asking for trouble. Mm -hmm. um, the money that's going to vaccine, though, eventually will be good, but it won't be any good if it can't be delivered. Mm -hmm. And so the delivery mechanism, especially in areas where the government isn't in control, I mean, it's ironic that in areas where the government is in control, people don't want to have one, a vaccine. There's, a, there's an anti-vaccine movement. But in areas where there is no government, you've got to make sure that the um, non-state NGOs, civil society, sometimes the private sector are playing a role in reaching people because unless we get the vaccine to everyone, then the disease is still around, especially if it mutates. Um, in terms of the uh, lessons and the silver lining of the disease though, I would answer it by saying there'll only be a silver lining if we learn the right lesson. And the right lesson is that there's a connected world. And if you, uh, you're only as strong as the weakest link in the chain. Mm -hmm. And if we don't understand that it's a connected world, both locally and globally, if you're locally, if you don't get everyone covered, then it's going to spread because of local transmission. But globally, if you don't get everyone covered, there's going to be global uh, transmission. Um, that is the essential lesson of this. And I think it's a lesson that crosses national boundaries. It crosses political boundaries. 
It applies whether you're living in a democracy or an autocracy. Um, there's got to be a recognition that in a hyper-connected world, which is what we live in, if we don't manage the global commons together, then we're all going to be poorer and less safe as a result. And I think that's a really important message. Um, when those global commons are not well tended, people who are wandering around in the global commons end up getting, being vulnerable and taken advantage of. And that's where, where the conversation started. So I think there's a, mm -hmm. th there is a lesson in this crisis. It's not clear whether it will be learned, but that's up to all of us. Right, right. Well, I, you've helped me learn a lot in the time that we've had. I wish it could be more, but I really, I, I know how busy both of you are and the important work that you're doing. So I thank you so much for thank taking you. time to, uh, to, to work through some of this. I wish you Godspeed as you continue and um, that, that 2020 will become 2021 and that we will push through and, and with it aided very much by the work that you're both doing. So thank, thank you. you so much. Thanks very Thanks much. Thanks to you, you, Mindy. Thanks to thank you, you Secretary. Ambassador. Very nice to see you. And let's nice hope that we can meet in the near future here in Washington or New York. Also, Mindy, and let's continue all these efforts. Thank you very Thanks much. Thanks very much indeed. Bye. Bye now.